Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. and welcome to Park Cities Baptist. Uh, my name is David Huey. I'm actually the minister to families here and uh, I'm really, really excited to come and be a part of this service and maybe just to share a little bit about what God's been laying on my heart this week. We've been going through a series called The Power of One and really it's an overview of our church's strategy. What we really believe, uh, God is taking our church and, and, and kind of taking those step by step in order to, to really make disciples. So if you've been with us over the past month, you've seen uh, that we first talked about that we believe our church worships together, and we, we do that weekly. And we don't apologize for that. We say that we believe that every one of you, every one of us should come and be a part of a worship service every single week, that it should be a priority to you and to your family. And we believe that if you do that, you'll begin to stir in your heart a, a desire to connect a desire to connect not only to God, but to other people. And so we do that through small groups. So we ask that our folks will come and they'll worship weekly and that they'll connect weekly through our Bible studies. And that may look uh, like one of our age graded th for our children or our students, but it might be one of our adult classes or our women's ministry classes. And so we say that you worship weekly and that you connect weekly. And then out of that, when you connect to God and connect to other folks, you have a desire to serve. And we believe that people will serve on a regular basis. And maybe that's through uh, right here in the, in the walls of our church, in our children's ministry or our student ministry. Maybe it's with one of our uh, ministry partners across this campus or across the city or in South Texas or around the world. So this morning, we're going to be talking about our final piece of our strategy, which is multiply. We believe that if you worship weekly and you connect weekly and you serve regularly, that the outpouring of all of that will culminate in what we're going to be talking about today, which is that you will multiply disciples. So before we get there, I want you to take your Bible or your iPad or whatever it is that you have, and I want you to find Matthew chapter 28. And I want to tell you, if you've been a part of the church for a long period of time, especially Park Cities, you've seen and heard this passage that we're going to be talking about this morning. It's a familiar passage to you. And so my challenge to you this morning is not to check out not to say, oh, I've heard that before, so I know what he's going to say. I want to encourage you to stick with me. I really believe that God has something fresh and new to share with you this morning. And so we're going to look at a passage uh, in chapter 28 towards the very, very end of the, the passage. And it, what we're going to find is that Jesus, all the events of Jesus' life have already taken place. The, the events of the crucifixion, the events of the resurrection. Jesus has been on the earth for 40 days uh, he's been with his disciples. Over 500 people have seen Jesus during this time, and it's a, he's about to ascend to heaven. He's about to go back and be with his fathers, and he wants to take these last few moments in order to really pour into his disciples and tell them, okay, you've been with me for three and a half years. You've seen all these great events that have taken place. You've seen me heal the sick. You've seen me raise the dead. You've seen me do all of these things. You've seen me defeat death. Now, let me give you your marching orders. And this is what he says. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the, Fa name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am always, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus is telling them 
Before I leave, the one thing I want you to get is this, to make disciples. It's your one job. That's it. Now, when I read that passage, it actually reminded me, bizarre enough, is when I was in seventh grade. When I was in seventh grade, I actually played for a YMCA football team. And we were awesome. I'm not going to lie. We were awesome. We were the Black Knights. We went 6-0. and And truthfully, no one even scored on us in the season. We were pretty awesome. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're looking at him going, there's no way that man played football. But it's true, I did. And I, and I probably wasn't much, much bigger than this, right? So I, we played football. And the cool thing is probably the reason why we went 6-0 and and the reason why we were unscored on is because we were led by this really genius coach, my dad. <laughs> and because he was a genius coach, he put me at quarterback. I know what you're thinking. Ah, coach's son, right? Here we go. But, but he put me at quarterback, and, and so I was really excited. And I can remember about halfway through the season, maybe game three or four, I get really amped up for sports. I was really, really excited. And uh, this, this one particular game, game three or four, uh, it's the first play of the game. We have the ball. My dad calls in the play. And so we get in the huddle, and I tell everyone the play. And I get up to the line of scrimmage, and I take the snap. And I turn to give the ball to the running back, and he's not there. And I look, and I panic. And so I begin to run around to the left, and I just get creamed. I'm going, okay, no big deal. First play of the game. So I go back, and I see the call from my dad, the same play. So I go to the huddle, and I tell the guys, okay, here's the play. And I go, and I take the snap, and I turn to give the ball, and the running back goes the other way. The line goes the other way. And so I panic, and I run around to the left, and I get smacked again. And so now frustration is starting to set in. And so I go back to the huddle, and I look up, and I see the call being play- called from my dad. And sure enough, the same play. And so I go to the huddle, and I tell them the play. And we go, and I get ready, and I take the snap, and I turn to the left, and wouldn't you know it? The running back is not there. He's going the other way. The line goes the other way. And I panic and I run around and I get smacked again. And like the leader that I am of the team, I get up and I just start screaming at my teammates. I believe that I even went over and maybe grabbed a face mask and I said, you guys need to run the play. And my running back looked at me and said, no, you're not running the play. See, the play was called 31 dive. If you've you've played football, you know It was the simple play of taking the snap and turning to my right and handing the ball to the running back. But in my frustration and in my hype, I I turned to the left every single time. I had one job, one job, one mission to give the ball here. And what happened is when I was focused on what I wanted to do, I kept running to the left and I kept paying the price and I started blaming everyone else. And Jesus tells us the very same thing. He goes, look, before I leave, I've got one job for you to do, and that is to make disciples. You're going to see this morning as we talk about how to make disciples, it's very, very easy. He says you make disciples not only by going, but also by baptizing and also by teaching. Look at what Jesus says here again in in verse 18, how he starts things off. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth, have been given to me. Jesus says, look, the battle is already won. I've already taken care of everything. The play is already called. If you just run it right, we're going to get it taken care of. Matthew spends nearly half of his gospel talking about Jesus' authority. Look what he says in in chapter 7. He says, Jesus had authority in his teaching. In chapter 8, Jesus had authority in his healing. He could heal people from from sickness. And and what Justin just saying about could change the leper's spots. In chapter 9, Matthew talks about Jesus has authority for forgiving sin. In chapter 10, Matthew says Jesus had the authority over Satan. And he gave that to his disciples for them to be able to use as well. And now at the end of his message, Matthew says in, in chapter 28, Jesus has all authority. Not just over sickness and not just over sin, but everything. And it's all taken care of. And he says, look, 
I'm giving that for you to use. You can do that whatever you want with it. But you've got one job to do, and that's make disciples. So if Jesus has all authority and he's given it to us, how, do, how does he tell us to do it? It first says, you've got to be willing to go. Now, the main verb in this passage is make disciples. That's the command. But you also see this other verb where it says go. It's the supporting verb. It's telling you've got to be willing to go, but it's also as you go. It's this idea that you have to be willing to say goodbye. You've got to uh, be ready to send. You've got to be ready to, to leave where you are and be a missionary. And it also means as you go. As you do life, not aimlessly walking around hoping someone will ask you about Jesus, but as you live your life, as you serve on the PTA, as you work in your business, as you live your life in your community, as you raise your kids, you are making disciples. So the word here is as you go and also being purposely go. That you've got to be willing to say, you know what, maybe God is calling me to the mission field. I remember being in, in my student pastor days, you'd always have teenagers when you would talk about this and go, well, I'm nervous to say yes to what God has for my life because what if he sends me to Africa? You know what the answer is to that? What if? I mean, what better thing to know that God has called you to go and you are obedient to that? I don't believe you'd have any other joy in your life than saying yes to God. I will go. And for some of us, that is it. God's challenge to us is to go, to leave, to leave Dallas, to leave North, North, North Dallas, to leave Texas, and maybe go somewhere else and make disciples. And others of us, it's, it's as you go, that God has placed you in a very specific place, in your workplace and in your home and in your community. It is by no accident that on my street, I have the neighbors that I have. It's by no accident that I serve on a school board or I work where I'm at because I'm called to make disciples. It's by no accident. So Jesus says, as you go. And there's a balance here. He says, not only as you go, you're going to be baptizing and you're going to be teaching. Look, look what he says in verse 19 again. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The word here, baptized, really is talking about uh, proclamation. It's the idea of evangelism. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, it's going to be up on the screen here, it says that God's will is that no one should perish, but all should come to repentance to Him. God's will is that all will understand His grace and His mercy and will come to Him. And we can't kid ourselves. When we look at, at the world around us and we see that it's broken, and we see that things are not going well, and it doesn't seem like there's any hope in sight, we can't kid ourselves to think that a political figure or charity or good works or just being nice to our neighbor is going to fix all that. It is going to be the proclamation of Jesus Christ and hope of His saving grace in their life. We can't expect that our neighbors without Jesus Christ are going to magically make it to heaven someday because we're nice to them or because they live next door to a Christian. We have to understand that people are going to be separated from Jesus for eternity. And that's a scary, scary thing. So we have to be able to willing to, to share Jesus with them. The cool thing is, is that someone has shared with me. Someone shared with me when I was 15 years old. I remember when... Uh, when I was in like ninth grade, my, my buddy, I grew up in Memphis, his name was G-Dub, G-W, that was, an, I, I think it stood for George Washington, and, jo and G-W wanted me to go to church with him, not because he cared about my salvation, but because he was dating another girl in the youth group, and he didn't want to go by himself, and so he invited me to go to this church in, in Memphis, and, and I came in, and, and you can imagine 15-year-old uh, David who had long hair down to the middle of his back and his ears pierced, and I was wearing my Led Zeppelin t-shirt, I believe, and I walk in the doors, and they look and go, wow, there's potential, <laughs> right? And they saw in me a 15-year-old that was awkward and, and weird and was into heavy metal. 
And the youth pastor began to talk to me and began to invite me in. And other people in the youth group began to pull me in. And I met another guy by the name of David. He was three years older than me. He was a senior uh, when I was a freshman. And David, I think, saw in me kind of the junior version of him from a few years earlier. And he just wanted to hang out. He even taught me a secret handshake, which I'm not going to teach you because it was secret. <laughs> and he just began to pour into my life. And, and, and over time, he began to talk about Jesus' love for me. And David led me to the Lord. He began to talk about how much uh, God's love was for me. And he didn't do that to be harsh with me. He didn't do that uh, to be confrontational. He wasn't a jerk. We're not asking anyone to be a jerk. He did it because he loved me. And my life intersected with Jesus when I was 15 years old, and it changed my life forever. I was the high school, you know, dropout nearly. And God changed my life. I went to the college that I went to because I met Jesus. I went on the mission field after college because I had met Jesus. I married the woman that I married because I met Jesus. I'm at Park Cities and standing on this stage proclaiming God's love to you because I met Jesus and because someone told me about Jesus. And the truth is, is that the majority of you sitting in this room are here today because someone loved you enough to share Jesus with you. Where's my buddy Keith? Is Keith Beasley in here? Keith, I want you to stand up. Tell me, tell me how old you were when you accepted Christ and who shared Christ with you? Awesome. Debbie Price. Where are you at, Debbie? I saw you down here. Ready you are. Debbie, how old were you and who led you to the Lord? Your parents. Are they in here? They should be, right? Stan Theobot, I saw you earlier. Who, who led you to the Lord? I love this story. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Nine. nine years old. It's amazing. Susan Brokaw. Where are you at? Stand up, Susan. I see you over here. I was nine years old, and it was my Bible school teacher. Awesome. Bailey, I saw you. Calling you on the spot. Where are you at? That's awesome. Way to go, mom and dad. See, I could call you all up here. We could, we could do one after the next. Th I was this old. And maybe you don't know the exact date, but you know that someone loved you enough to share Christ with you. And that could be our worship service. We could end right there, right? We could celebrate that. And our walks of life are all different. Not everyone was the, the guy listening to Metallica at 15 and met Jesus. It was through Billy Graham. It was through mom and dad. It was through a VBS teacher. Someone loved them enough to share Jesus with them. What stops us? What stops us from being that person in someone else's life? We just watched uh, two kiddos get baptized. That is my favorite thing we do as a church. It drives me crazy when people get baptized and we golf clap. Oh, that's so sweet, right? No, that's a celebration. And I don't believe that anyone would have thought, wow, those two kids were baptized because someone was confrontational with them. They really challenged their beliefs. No, mom and dad shared Christ with them because they loved them. And we get to see that acted out. So what stops you from being that to someone else? Now, I also know that there are probably some in this room that have never given their life to Christ. Maybe someone who hasn't been loving enough to share that with you. And you don't know the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. I want to make sure that you have that opportunity today. I'd love to be the one to talk to you about that. Maybe there have been others that, that someone has shared with you and you really don't know what it's like to follow Christ or you're nervous of what your life would look like if you really handed your full will over to Him. We'd love to answer questions for you. There are people around you. There are people that have brought you. Or there'll be folks after the service that would love to talk to you about that. We want to make sure that you have that opportunity. So Jesus says to go, to be intentional, to do that, to leave North Dallas or to do that in your community. And as you go, and he says to proclaim Jesus through baptism. He's saying, uh, give a proclamation of Jesus' love 
for other folks. And then he also says to reach and teach. Look what he says again in verse 20. It says, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus not only tells them to proclaim him, to talk about him, to share his love with one another, but he also says to teach. And I love this because I think there's a balance here. I think we, we tend to, whatever the, the personality of the church is, we tend to always be out of whack in one way or the other. One church will be all about evangelism and we forget what discipleship looks like. Or we're all about discipleship and we want to take care of our own, but we forget that there are lost and hurting people out there. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Those go hand in hand. Talk about my love and teach them to obey. It is discipleship. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus is is working with his disciples, and he says uh, that he opened their mind to understand Scripture. See, Jesus was was working with 12 Jewish men. These guys knew the Scripture. It was the Old Testament. They knew the Torah. They knew the law. They knew the prophets. Now, other parts of Scripture said they were uneducated, but they they grew up in this. They knew this. You could say that they were probably cultural Jews. Maybe Jesus is you know, mission statement was rescuing one another from cultural Judaism to follow me every day. It was something like that, I'm sure, right? And so these men knew the law. They knew what the Old Testament said. And Jesus said that he opened their mind up for them to understand the scriptures. Why? Not so they could pass a Facebook quiz, not so they could be the smartest person in the room, but so they could put it into practice. That they could get their hands and their feet dirty. They could could understand Scripture and put it into practice and be obedient to Him. Think about doctors. If we have doctors in the room, what a waste it would be if we went all through medical school and we perfected our craft and never practiced medicine. Or these musicians that are up here, that they, they work on their skill and they never perform. What good would it be for a disciple of Jesus to to learn and to grow in Christ and never disciple and never reproduce? Matthew 28, 20 says it's not about observing, it's about about putting it into practice. 2 Timothy 2, uh, verses 1 and 2 says this. You then, my child, this is Paul writing to Timothy, who was a young pastor in a church. It says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Look what Paul, an older pastor, is saying to a younger pastor. First says, you, my child. He's going, look, boy, listen to me. Let me get your attention here. You need to get this. You, Timothy, understand what I'm about to tell you. Be strengthened in the grace of Christ Jesus. Grow in your faith. Be a part of the body. Feed on what God is teaching you. Grow and learn. Why? Not just so you can be better or that you know more, but why? Because what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You learn so that you can pour into someone else. He later on says in verses 3 and 4, he says, a soldier trains to fight. In verse 5, he says, an athlete trains to compete. In verse 6, he says, a farmer sows in order to reap. A disciple of Jesus disciples. That's who we are. And many of you already do this. This This message is not meant to be a guilt trip because many of you already do this. You're serving in a preschool class. You're telling that, that little four and five-year-old, I have a four and a six-year-old, and so I, I'm so thankful for you that you pour into the life of my kids every single week just to tell them how much God loves them. There's some of you that, that pour into the life of a teenager, and you don't see awkwardness, and you don't see rebellion. You see someone like me at a 15-year-old, and you see, wow, they've got potential. I want to make a difference in their life, and I want to help shape that young man and that young woman to become an adult that follows Jesus. Many of you teach adult classes, or you sing in the choir, or you serve in the band, or you greet people as they come in, or you work on 
on the bus stops in Preston Plaza, or you serve with our, with our ministry partners in South Dallas, or you take those trips across the world. But the truth is, we need more. We need more. And here's the deal, folks. God's marching order is to make disciples. One job. One job. That's it. And when we get off focus of that, you're like seventh grade David running over here, get, about to get clobbered, and you're about to get frustrated. Because when we get off focus, we start focusing on our perceived needs. We start looking at things around us and going, that's what God wants. He wants a style of music like this. He wants a building that looks like this. He wants a personality of a preacher that does like this. I want a building that's, that's this tall, or I want more underground garage parking. I, I want all of these things, my perceived needs, and we get off track, and what happens is then when those things aren't delivered, we get frustrated. And God says, no, 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 no. My one job for you is to make disciples. See, these things are great. Buildings are great. Air conditioning is great. These chairs are great. Pews are great. Music is great. Different styles of music are great. Different personalities of preachers are all great. But they're not the mission. They're the tools for the mission. A baseball player doesn't come up to bat with a bat and think, this is, this is the job. No, 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 no. It's a tool for the job. The bat helps him score runs. It helps him win the game. Music is a tool to get us on the mission. Bible study is a tool to get us on the mission. Our goal is not to, to sit in Bible study just to learn. It's a tool in order to get our hands and feet dirty and make disciples. And here's the thing. When we get off mission, that's when we start bumping to each, into each other. That's when we get frustrated. And that's when the outside world, brothers, sisters, that's when the outside world begins to look at the church and go, I don't want a part of that. I don't, I don't like that. That's when we start hearing those words like hypocrite. That's when we start hearing, he Christians don't have joy. Christians are bland because we're off mission. I don't know if you've ever seen these videos that are on, I've seen them kind of pop up on my feed on Facebook or on YouTube. And if you haven't, I encourage you uh, after church to start looking these things up. But, but all of these videos kind of look very similar. And it goes something like this. It's usually dad's birthday or granddad's birthday. And, and dad has been colorblind his whole entire life. He hasn't been able to see color. He, his eyes are not functioning the way that God had intended them to function. And he sees color, he sees the world around him kind of bland. And I know that there's probably some of you that are sitting in this room that actually deal with that and you know what I'm talking about. And, and so in these videos, uh, it's maybe his birthday and, and family buys, he, buys him these special pair of glasses. I don't know if you've seen these or not. They're phenomenal. And dad can put these glasses on and he can see color. And so they, he's opening it up, and he's nervous, and he's kind of wondering what's going to take place. And, and you see it, and they're all videoing it. And he puts these glasses on, and then he opens his eyes, and he looks up. And the reaction is the same every single time. It's complete celebration. They begin to look around, and they, oh my gosh, that's what a tree looks like. That's green. And they look, that's flowers. That's what, the sky is blue, and they start crying, and they're, they're panicking, and, and the family around them is going, yes, 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 and everyone, it's just a big celebration, or you could say it's like worship. He's finally so overwhelmed with what, what his eyes were always intended to do, and now he can see. And that bland life that he's always experienced now comes alive, and for the believer, that's the same thing is that if you're not experiencing joy or you're not experiencing life that God has always intended you, it's probably because you're not right in the middle of His mission. If you're not experiencing joy with the church, it's probably not someone else's fault. It might be yours. You know, when we break up with someone, you go, it's not you, it's me, right? No, no, it's, it's probably you, right? 
If you're not experiencing joy in your life, no one else is responsible for joy in your life. You understand that? I don't mean that to be rude. I mean that to be, to be truthful. No one else can bring joy to your life. It, it, only you and your relationship with Jesus. And the way you find joy is finding yourself right in the center of God's will. That's it. That's the only thing that will bring you joy. That's the only thing that will bring you uh, excitement and happiness and purpose. And how do you do that? It's begin to make disciples. I watch teenagers over the years as we take them on mission trips. And in some cases, I make it really, really uncomfortable for them because we walk into a house and, I, and I'll say, uh, start the conversation with, with someone. I'll say, hey, has anyone ever told you about the love of Christ Jesus that he, that he is for you? And they'll say, no. And I'll go, great. This teenager right here is going to tell you about that, right? And they, okay. And then they do it. And, and they're nervous and they're scared and then they do it. And at the end, they're always like, that was phenomenal. Why? Because we're living out what God has called us to do. We're right on mission. There's nothing better. There's nothing better. So how do you do it? Get involved. How do you make disciples? It's as you go. It's in your home. Dads, be the primary disciple makers of your children. Don't leave that to youth pastors or to children's pastors. You take up the mantle. You disciple your kids. It's in your community. Be intentional with your neighbors. Being nice is not enough. It's in your church. We've got great children's workers. We've got great youth workers. We've got amazing Bible teachers. But many of you are more than equipped to invest in the life of a teenager. More, more of you are equipped to say, yes, it's time for me to go on a mission trip. It's in our church. It's in around the world. And it's really, really simple. The way you can do it is just be equipped with the three questions that we talk about all the time. Look at what our church says. We, we just says, if you can do these three things, I promise you, you'll start finding joy and purpose in your life. The first question is this, what is God saying to me? What we mean by that is as you study Scripture and as you open it up, just like the disciples, as you hear from God, it's, it's what is He saying to me? What is He telling me to do? And the second question is, how will I obey? Not how will I obey with good intentions, but how will I actually follow what God is telling me to do through the Scripture that I just read? What is He calling me to do? How will I obey? And will you do it? And number three, whom will I tell? And I think for many of us, this is the scariest part because you go, I don't want to be confrontational. I don't, I don't want to be in an argument or I don't know how to share my faith. We're not even really asking you to do that quite yet. We're just saying, have a conversation. Read God's word and tell someone about it. Could you imagine what that would be like? Hey, let me tell you something that I read today. What do you think about this? And the conversations that you'd have. Ephesians chapter four, what we've been looking at all month long, boils down to this, is that each one of you have been gifted for this purpose. Each of us are different. Some of you are nearly OCD like me. Some of you are not. Some of you are very outgoing. Some of you are reserved. Some of you are great musicians. Some of us are not. Some of you know how to talk to people and you can have this conversation. And some of us really struggle with that. But God has gifted you for this very purpose. The church is God's big hope to reach the world. That's it. The people in this room are God's big hope to reach the world. And you can look around the room. I could tell you to look at somebody around the room and kind of stare at them awkwardly. But the truth is, is that you can hear that statement and you can be either be encouraged or you can be discouraged. You can be discouraged by looking and going, well, that person's weird, or that person's a hypocrite, or we're all just messed up and we don't get it. Or you can go back to what Jesus says, is that he's given you all authority. He's given you all the gifts. He's given you all the power, and it's been one. And you can do it through his strength. And look what he finally says at the very end of, of 2820. He says, I am with you always to the end of the age. I love that. Because Jesus says, I will equip you 
I'll win the battle for you. Just go talk about me. Just make disciples and I'll be with you. I'll help you do it. My encouragement to you today is that you'll join us. That you'll be a part of something great, what Park Cities is doing. That you'll, say, you'll no longer say, hey, I want to just sit on the sidelines. I want to be a part of this. And I want to encourage you to join us. Others of you, you might be sitting in here, you, you don't even know what that looks like. You don't even know what that means to follow Jesus. We want to encourage you to join us. We want to encourage you to come be a part of the Christian faith. You don't understand that maybe Jesus came and He lived a perfect life and He died on the cross and rose again and defeated death on your behalf. And you can be a part of something special. And He can change your life just like He did for me as a 15-year-old. I want to encourage you to do that. So we're going to have an opportunity as I pray. Justin's going to come and, and sing and close us out. I'll be right down here in the front for just a few moments. We'll be out here in the response room after the service. If you've got questions, we'd love to come answer those for you. Okay, let me pray. Father, we thank you again for all that you do. Thank you for equipping us for your mission. We have one job. Let us be obedient in that. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.